Hi, I'm Chris Group, and this is the Evidence-Based Esthetician, and today we are joined by Dr. Larry Group. Hi there. And we're going to be talking about absorption dynamics, and um, it's, it's kind of an interesting subject, one that's not talked about in aesthetic school. And it's dynamic. And it is, it's a very dynamic, very, very dynamic so topic. So hopefully absorb it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as we go through all of these episodes, you will understand um, that Dr. Group is the pun master. Um, the pun meister. Okay, or the pun meister. So what are absorption dynamics and why is it important in aesthetics? Um, the epidermis is an incredible barrier to keep things out and keep water in. That's what its biggest function is. Um, and so how do we get products across the epidermis in order to be able to um, maybe have nutrition to the skin or, or how do they cross or can they cross or do they cross? And if you look on TV and you see infomercials about Sub-D or you look at um, TV ads that claim that you know deep dermal penetration in the next five minutes, can that happen or is it just marketing? Um, and so let's talk about it. Well, we like to do a lot of hype busting here. And because this is the evidence-based esthetician, we're going to base everything on evidence. Whoa, what a concept. <laughs> we're going to look at the research from leading researchers who've actually have tested this, who are not being paid by Procter & Gamble and other companies to make you buy something. Kind of important if you're starting your practice out and you're deciding what product line to buy, and you're looking and basing your decisions on marketing or things on websites, a lot of times what's shown on the website and what really happens uh, isn't, isn't adding up together. In many cases, a lot of the really cool topicals and things like that, if they could get to the dermis, might, might be able to do some of the things that are being advertised. But in many cases, the molecules are just too big and don't make it across the epidermis. So there we have some really nice things on the epidermis. Before I start though, that's kind of an important point. Just because something doesn't make it to the dermis doesn't mean that it doesn't have a benefit for the epidermis. But when the claim is being said that this product goes to the dermis and influences this or that, um, in many cases that we really have to investigate, does that product actually get there? Here's what we're gonna talk about today. How do molecules get across the epidermis? What are the conditions and how big or what factors influence whether or not a molecule does that? What we're not going to cover today is the legalities of that. Because remember, things that influence a bodily function are actually drugs, uh, according to the FDA. That we can save that for another exciting episode where we can nerd out on what the FDA has to say about these things. So let's get started on these things. First thing that, that we need to bring up and we're going to talk about is called the 500 Dalton Rule. Um, this is the piece of research, the article you'll see up here on the screen, that uh, most scientists are using, or at least referring to. Um, it was done a while back, I believe it was 2000. Uh, it's been looked at and cited and uh, built upon by many other scientists. Um, it's peer-reviewed. What that means is that other uh, researchers who don't have any commercial interest have looked at this research and decided if it was had followed scientific principles, if it had some validity, if their methods were proper, and before it was ever allowed to be published. Um, this wasn't published in Mad Magazine or Glamour. This was published in a scientific journal, which sort of gives it a little bit more credibility. That's not to say that the information that's on the web isn't credible, but you just don't know. So we, when we're making decisions about whether or not something can actually happen or not, the reason why we want to use peer-reviewed research or research that has some validity is because then we can it has a much greater credibility. It allows us to make decisions based on what we think is going to be science as opposed to marketing or someone with a commercial interest in selling us something. Well, I think this is also important because um with things like Facebook and all the social media, more and more information is getting out there, but more and more misinformation is getting out there. And even if it comes from a source, uh, somebody who is got a very high um, aesthetic licensure, they might be Sodesco, they might be a master esthetician, um, and then they, they put a product on and look at how this penetrates, it's still probably not happening depending on what the molecule size is. And what we always say, it all goes back to science. And if we use the science and understand the science, we make better choices for our clients and also for our practice. 
Yeah, you know, this 500 Dalton rule seems kind of esoteric or kind of, you know, out there. But in reality, this is what all the leading researchers like uh, and companies that are developing products to go across the skin like 3M are basing it based on size. The molecule um, is if it's more than 500 Daltons. And we're going to examine and try to take a look at how big a Dalton is. Uh, to start out with, like, you know, a dozen means 12, right? Uh, if we're going to look at things like weight, so Dalton's just a name. If we look at weight, we can weigh really big things. So we use things like tons. Um, you wouldn't want to weigh a paperclip and how many tons that would be. It'd be like 0.00002, right? Oh my. Oh my. A lot of O's. Whoa. So we use other, we have things like ounces. So we have different increments and different units of measurement for weight. All the Dalton is, is a very small unit. It measures very small weights, okay? So... Um, we could also measure a molecule in pounds, but it would be, again, 0 .00000000, 000 000. much easier to use a, a unit that's already set up to be small. So that's what the Dalton is. So basically what you're saying is size matters. Well, we're going to get to that. There are other conditions that, that make, make it so a molecule can go across or not. Some of the conditions we can control, but as estheticians or as docs or skincare professionals, do we get to control the size of the molecule that comes in the bottle? No. The manufacturer does, right? So in this case, this is or why science does. Or science does. <laughs> well, but we're saying if we're going to buy a product, whatever, however it's packaged is what it is. That's why we need to ask questions from the people we buy these things from. If we're going to spend our money on it, and, we want, and we're being told that these particular products go across the epidermis to the dermis and have some wonderful skin function, then we probably want to know these things. If they don't have that knowledge or don't have that information from you, you either send them back to go get it or don't buy the product. This is how we keep from having shelves full of stuff that we bought um, because it sounded really cool, used it on a couple clients, didn't work out, and now we're stuck with thousands of dollars of product, okay? So 500 Dalton we're gonna get to here. Uh, something important I wanna point out as well is that there's lots of uses for a particular product, right? In many cases, there's products that are used for um, a condition, like let's say eczema, and there's products that's used for uh, other things like that. It's really important as estheticians or for people who don't have an FDA license or a DEA license to prescribe, so it would be like a doctor, that we don't start talking about drug effects. And what that means is the FDA has come out and said if something has the effects on the human body or an animal to affect its, its function, then it's a drug. Now this particular episode is not going to be about what the FDA says. We'll nerd out on that later. But the point is, is that we really want to talk about things that beautify the skin, right? This is the evidence-based esthetician. So a lot of the claims being made on TV aren't about aesthetics, though. Mm -hmm. They're about, about things like collagen building and things like that. That's where they get into trouble because that's not something that's under our scope, right? We're not in the business of building collagen, are we? Well, yes and no. Legally, as a doctor, I guess I can build as much collagen as I want. But as an esthetician, can you do that or not? Well, the point is this, is you don't, you don't, you're not allowed to legally advertise that. That doesn't mean that we can't use best practices and do, use it with what works. So we're going to focus on, when we look at this science, not necessarily what, whose license can do what. So when I'm, I'm going to be pointing out some things about how molecules get across the skin. That doesn't mean because it, it does that, that we should be doing that. We're just talking about when claims are made about this does this product makes collagen build in three days. Is that possible? And can the product even get there? So okay. um, let's get started. Now, Chris, you've been in this field for many moons. What are some of the products that you think are, are, are being advertised that um, might get us into trouble with this? Things like uh, hyaluronic acid, is that something? Well, you mean get in trouble with well, as far as like when we're, we're making a claim that this hyaluronic acid is going to do all these wonderful things for the dermis, but it's such a big, big molecule that in many cases it probably doesn't make it to the dermis. But there's that seems to be a hot commodity right now. Oh, the big things I think right now are like um, HA, so hyaluronic acid, and also different um, versions of uh, collagen. So like peptides? Peptides, um, and, you know, some of the things out there... Um, uh, like Nutrixel 3000. There, there's lots of things that are claiming to build collagen um, in in the dermis um, and things that are affecting the dermis. So collagen elastin is another one. So they're saying that it builds elastin. So, I mean, all you have to do is watch TV at night to see a ton of commercials from products that aren't even professional 
and great products and all the wonderful things that they supposedly do. Sure, and yeah, there's two hour infomercials on these things that have medical drug-like effects. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so 500 Dalton roll, let's talk about what it means. We have the article up on the screen. What I highly encourage you to do is look it up and take a look. If you'd like to get it from us, we'll be happy to send it to you. But this is basically it. We have, the, it's a full text thing you can get if you put in, in Google, push, put in the word scholar. And what will pop up is something called Google Scholar. What that does is limit your uh, returns or the, your search results to things that are supposedly peer-reviewed, much more likely to be peer-reviewed research. Not always, but much better than, than someone uh, you know, from Zimbabwe who has a blog uh, as opposed to researchers do things. So we put in the 500 Dalton rule, and I've given you the citation for this. And what these researchers are showing here is that there are two questions that we kind of have to ask um, whether or not a molecule crosses. So the first one is, does the active ingredient have a known mechanism of action? So what that means is, is that how does it work? And what's the active ingredient? So in many cases, we know there's inactive ingredients, things like carriers and propylene glycol and water, deionized water. But the thing, the, the little ingredient in there that's supposedly doing the action, does it actually have a mechanism of action? How does it actually work in the tissue? That's one of the questions. Uh, so can you explain a little bit more mechanism of action because you know, I, it's something I, that um, isn't used a lot in the aesthetic industry, but like, it, like it, it, give me an example of a mechanism yeah, of action. Yeah, let's do that. So, you know, I, I, I will probably spend another one of our episodes talking a little bit more on a, a different way of looking at this, but for our purposes today, the mechanism of, ac of action is how something works. So let's talk about it. It has a target and it has some sort of process. So here's one for us. Let's use aspirin. How does aspirin work? Well, aspirin is salicylic acid. Its mechanism of action is, is it binds to platelets and causes platelets to not be able to be activated or stick together. That's one of the mechanisms so, of, of So acid. people who have um, heart issues or things may take a baby aspirin or an aspirin a day right. to keep the, the blood flowing without having the platelets stick together. Right. So we can That's study that in the body and we can <clears throat> study that outside the body in the test tube, in vivo, in vitro. And again, we'll talk about that on a different, different episode. But that's, a, that's something that, that's known. It's, it's kind of plotted out how it works. It has a target, which is the platelet. And when it does something to the platelet, something else happens. In this case, the plates don't stick together. So that's the mechanism of action. Okay. When we're talking about the 500 Dalton rule, though, question two is kind of what we're looking at is, can the active ingredients penetrate the epidermis in sufficient concentrations over a time course consistent with its mechanism of action? You ready for the translation for that? Yes, please. Okay. I, I, I don't speak that language. So can the active ingredient get across the, ep can enough of the active ingredient get across the epidermis to do what it says it can do? Okay, so if not enough gets across, then it's not going to get to its mechanism of action. Well, you wouldn't be able to measure it then, right? So imagine, oh, let's use alcohol as an example. If you drink a thimble full of alcohol, it's still working, right? But you don't really notice the effects. If you drink a gallon of alcohol, then you start to see the effects on people. So sometimes it has to do with how much concentration is involved, right? Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that there always has to be a lot of something for it to, for it to work. Um, like insecticides and things like poisons or cyanides, it can be very, very small amounts can do an incredible amount of damage or death. Whereas other things need quite a bit of. Uh, how about vitamin C for one? Um, when we're talking about vitamin C that goes on the skin, we need quite a bit of it, more than you would think, because the sun is constantly oxidizing and, and inactivating the vitamin C. So this, this question, these are the questions that are posed by these researchers that did the 500 Dalton rule. So they're basically saying, can enough of this active ingredient get across the skin uh, with enough of, for, fast enough for it to do it? Now, it's another thing. Is eventually, the epidermis does let things in over time, right? It, it, it might take six or seven hours though. So if we put something on, does who has time to wait seven hours for it to work? So a lot of the things that we're using are topical formulations as doctors and skincare professionals and estheticians we're putting on. We have, sort of have an expectation that it's gonna have some sort of effect that we know the timing. Otherwise, we, we, if we said to somebody, put this vitamin A on your skin every night and in seven years, you're gonna look a lot better, <laughs> right? That's, Except that's you not just quite fast seven enough. Years. <laughs> um, but as opposed to some of the marketing hype, you put a Regenerist on and in three days, you're building collagen, right? That's the other end of this, you know, how fast this thing can happen. 
Okay. Apparently. So what are the things that decide if a molecule can pass through the epidermis? Now we know what molecules are real quick, right? We have atoms come together and make a molecule. So the smallest component of this active ingredient, if we broke it down into small components, if we broke it down any more, it would no longer be that thing. So let's use aspirin again. For salicylic acid, we keep cutting it up until the tiny part that if we cut it up one more time, it would no longer be salicylic acid. So the molecule is, a, is the smallest unit of a compound, if you will, right? So in this particular case, the three things that they looked at that we're, we're gonna talk about one of them, not three of them, is lipid solubility, which I won't bore you with. It has a lot to do with things that are fat soluble versus things that are water soluble. It has a lot to do with things because our skin is made up of what's called a phospholipid bilayer, which we've talked about and we'll talk about more about skin uh, structure and function. The other thing is the degree of ionization or how well charged something is. So a positively charged molecule, a negatively charged molecule. Now here's what makes life really confusing. Most molecules are, have both charges. One end of it is positive, the other end of it is, is negative. And it's not all or nothing. They have degree of, of relative charge. So I've nerded out about the hard stuff. Let's talk about the things that matter because here's what the scientists said when they did this research. Those other things are important, but the molecular size, size matters, is the most important factor of all those things. Okay, so one of the other things that we could talk about is the temperature of something, okay? Now, this actually has a direct impact on how we do things. How about this? When you go to put something on and it's a cold cream, and the temperature of it's cold versus if, if it's hot. Does it seem like it absorbs better to you if the, if the cream itself is warmed up? It does, or if the skin itself is warmed exactly. up. It's one of the reasons um, estheticians like to use hot towels exactly. or steam or things like that. In fact, uh, most of our aesthetic procedures is based on the concept of temperature, exactly mm -hmm. what some of our facials and things like that have very much to do with pores opening and things like that, right? Because heat, does two things. It does exactly that. It allows the Dilates. pores to open, but it also allows the actual molecules to move slightly faster because that's what heat means. It means that molecules are moving faster. As they're moving faster, they're having more motion, right? So they're actually getting through the little cracks that they can get through faster. That's mm -hmm. why temperature matters. So if you want to get more, more things across the skin, heat it up. There's our first pointer. Second one is going to be there's a lot of things that go on that show that the size is the, the limiting factor for things. But we're saying that in science, there's some scientists out there not trying to do something about that. They're doing these special molecules, uh, these, these coatings and things like that. That's sort of experimental science. So I, I, I have gotten questions on that. Well, what about, what about things like uh, you know, coatings and things like that? We're not going to discuss that for this particular lecture. That'd be some experimental science. And also, as, as estheticians and doctors, we're not actively making these things. So we're, we're, whatever's commercially available is what we're going to use. So we're going to talk about the things that are commercially available to us, not experimental science stuff. Okay, so we've talked about the 500 Dalton rule. Let's take an idea of how big is a Dalton, one Dalton, right? And here's how we can do that. I'm going to give you the Dalton weight of some common things that we use every day. Now, what we're saying, what the research has said, that if anything that's 500 Daltons or more is not going to easily pass through the epidermis. And as it gets larger and larger, it won't pass at all. So, so it's going to need some help. It's going to, well, and we can talk about in another episode, what would be the help? What am I, what, I like to pick on things. You, you'll, you'll find <laughs> Most that of the time out. it's me. <laughs> In this particular <laughs> case, I, I have something against Swiss apple stem cell extract, probably because there's very little peer-reviewed research to show that it works. Because but, we're not apples. But let's just assume that it does, because what we're, what the, the claim for Swiss apple stem cell extract is that by ingesting it, it somehow makes it through our epidermis, into our dermis, and, and preserves our age, because that keeps the apple from rotting, therefore it keeps you from rotting. <laughs> The average molecular weight in Daltons is 820. Which is 320 more than the 500 Dalton So rule. is it making it through the epidermis no. to the dermis? No. So does it even matter if it could do it or not do what it says? No. It never makes it there anyway. How about hyaluronic acid? Hyaluronic acid, the very smallest piece that we've seen commercially available is about 4,000 Daltons. And the 
hyaluronic acid that your body actually makes, what we call native, not Native American, is 1.2 million Daltons. So is that when making it to the dermis? Not, not without some help, right? Okay. And then you, you mentioned Matrixyl 3000. That's a, uh, I believe that's a trademark, or what we call a designer peptide. Difficult to find the Dalton weight. I was able to kind of put this together with a little bit from their patent um, to show that it's 812 Daltons, um, which, as we probably know, um, is not going to make it. How about vitamin C? Woohoo, 176. So it's less than 500 Dalton, so it easily makes oh, makes it through the epidermis. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons um, vitamin C, which is in a huge topic now also, is one of uh, the best ingredients that you can put on your skin because the molecular weight is small enough that it can actually penetrate the epidermis. Yeah, it gets there. And in another class, we can talk about what all the wonderful things that vitamin C does. And we'll use that, for, of course, from a research-based standpoint, not from a hype standpoint. Um, so they, they have some ideas that molecule size has a lot to do with how things get through. Okay. And so when you have a bunch of molecules together in one bottle, some are going to make it through and some are not. Okay. Here's one other factor that can affect whether or not something gets through. And again, if you think about it, some of the basis for the aesthetic treatments that we do, how much moisture the skin, the epidermis has, has a lot to do with how fast particular molecules can get through. Now, we've all heard oil and water doesn't mix, right? So super wet skin actually in some cases repels oily formulations. But for formulations that are what we call polar or water-based, mm -hmm. if you will, um, the, the wetter the skin, the more moist the skin is, and if it was warmer at the same time, then you would have better absorption. So hence why we use, would use something like a warm towel or something uh, when we're doing facials and things like that. Um, when you're doing your procedures, you, you do a lot of... Uh, other procedures like uh, chemical peels, microneedling, things like that. Uh, are you relying on, on moisture content or things like that? Or, or... Well, it, it depends. I mean, some of the procedures, I'm drying out the skin. Um, some of the procedures, if I was a laser that was attracted to water, that would actually make it attracted to water, exactly. not to the skin, so you wouldn't want any moisture. Um, and then, depending on if I'm uh, microneedling, I'm trying to push products through uh, the micro channels, then yes, I want the skin uh, wet. So it just depends on the procedure that I'm doing. So sometimes it's good to have the skin wet, sometimes it's not. And that's the whole point of going to aesthetic school, right? So you learn these things and know when it's the appropriate time to add moisture to the skin or when it's time to dry it out or when it's a contraindication for things like, a, let's say, a carbon dioxide laser or something like that. Concentration. So the more of the product we put on the skin, the more makes it through. That seems sort of intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. But in many cases, though, because of economics, we would like to say to ourselves, this stuff's expensive, so I'm not going to use that much. So keep in mind, the more that you put on the skin, the more makes it through. But we also have to balance that with dosing, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say something does have a drug-like effect on that. Um, there's only so much you should put on the skin. Uh, how about chemical peel? What do you think about that? If we put more on, is that an issue? It can be. It depends on the chemical. Exactly. Pill. Right. So, I mean, sometimes you, you keep putting on until you get to the clinical endpoint, and sometimes putting too much on is not going to be beneficial for the client. So um, that's why we get trained in different chemical peels. And that's the important thing that you bring up, is that every procedure you're going to perform, get training on it to the point you understand what the clinical endpoint. And Chris, you and I talk about this all the time. Let's have just a, a two-minute discussion of why do we train the clinical endpoint as opposed to uh, some cookie cutter or recipe formula of how we do things? Well, because... What is it, and what, I'm sorry, and what does it mean to train the clinical endpoint? Um, well, when I do uh, my laser training or I do my microneedling training, I always tell people it's not so much about the device. You could use different lasers for hair reduction, but um, it's just like if you're going to the mall and you've got three modes you can get there. You can walk, you can drive, or you can ride your bike. The one thing you have to know is where the mall is because if you don't know where the mall is, the bike, the walking, the legs, and the car, none of them are going to get you there. If you don't know what your clinical endpoint should and does look like, then how do you know when you get there and how do you know when you've gone past it? So you want to get to the clinical endpoint so they get an effective treatment, but you don't want to go past the clinical endpoint because you want to do a safe treatment. 
And I suppose that would sort of necessitate or mandate that you know what, that someone out there is showing you the appropriate clinical endpoint. And that exactly. can be a problem too. If we go onto YouTube and let's pick microneedling, I've seen some clinical results where the people are bleeding out their eyes and that's the end of their treatment. And I've seen some other where the skin's just pink. What's the appropriate endpoint? Well, I guess it would matter on the condition, but you can kind of see that if you really have to be trained in these things and know what the clinical endpoint looks like in order to safely and effectively provide treatment. And it's the same when we're talking about molecules and get, getting across and, the, and how much to use. Your protocol is gonna tell you how much of, them, of the, the product or topical to put on there. And that was based on people who have done it before and know what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's assume that we have a molecule that is 500 Daltons or less. How does it make it through the epidermis? Three different ways we're gonna talk about briefly. The transcellular pathway, the intracellular pathway, and the follicular pathway. So trans means to go across. So if something's the transcellular, it's going right through the keratinocytes. So here's a picture we have. It's got transcellular and intercellular, but all three of them are being shown here. Mm -hmm. Basically, the transcellular is going right through those keratinocytes, and it's gonna take a while to get through those. So certain types of molecules, those other factors we talked about, the charge, the fat solubility, the temperature, the concentration, all play into that. They have to be 500 or less, but all those other things sort of regulate how much and how fast mm -hmm. it gets across. Let's take a look, let's take a look at what the in intercellular has to do with. So what we're seeing is, is we're going around, in between the gaps between the keratinocytes, right? And can you tell me the difference? Because people say intra and inter. Intra is between, it was, it was, is within the same keratinocyte. And I put that up there because it is, is shown that way. That the actual proper name for this though is intercellular pathway. I'm glad you brought that up. Inter means between more than one. Intra means within one. Obviously, if it was within one, we would have the transcellular. So we're talking about intercellular, like interstellar space is in Or interstate between... and intrastate. I like interstellar space okay. better. Okay, we'll save for the space. <laughs> <laughs> Got to nerd out. So the intercellular is going between the gaps between the keratinocytes. Okay. And then the last pathway is called a follicular, which has a lot to do with the hair follicle, which mm -hmm. what we're saying is, is that that gap between the hair follicle and the dermal papilla in the sheath that goes around the hair follicle and all that, there's a gap between those. Mm -hmm. Molecules can get through there. Of the three, the follicular pathway seems like it's the biggest, allows the bigger molecules in. We're still talking about 500 Daltons though. Basically, the, to end this, the important things to get out of this is the idea that the size of the molecule has so much to do with whether or not it's gonna pass through the epidermis. Before we go to buy different skincare and different topicals, we wanna to ask our rep or ask the manufacturer or go online and talk with people saying, okay, can you show me the science or show me the, some, something, the, the breakdown that clinical trials were done showing that this product gets through the epidermis and, and into the dermis. Now, if it's got vitamin C, there's, we already know that, right? How about vitamin A? Is that one that makes it through? Yes. It does. So a lot of these are, are easy to find the answers to, but these are still the questions we want to ask, especially brand new uh, topicals and brand new products. Chris, how much money do you think um, it cost us to do an opening order of, of let's say, uh, I'll, pick a, I'm, I'll pick one out of the air, Obagi, not saying good or bad, just, just what's an opening order? Uh, yeah, general range. Normal opening orders can be anywhere from 1,000, 1,500. 1,500 is usually on um, the lower end to several thousand dollars. So we're talking about thousands of dollars of money. We, we want to ask the questions, what's the molecular size? And then in, in another episode, I guess the next important thing to ask is, what's the mechanism of action? Where is the science and research to show how this works, what the target is, and what it's, what it's doing once it gets there? In many cases, we can show a good mechanism of action, but if the molecule's bigger than 500 Daltons, it doesn't matter. Chris, what's your takeaway points from this section? Um, well, it, it's always about learn what the science is. Um, salespeople are salespeople. They're trying to sell you something. So sometimes what comes out of their mouth 
isn't quite the truth. Um, They're also good resources too. So a, a good salesperson is also the person that's going to give you that information. So yeah. it all comes down to you you asking the right questions. Oh yeah, and I've had salespeople where I've asked what the Dalton weight was and it looked at me like I had three heads um, or what the mechanism of action is. So if you understand why something works the way that it works, you're going to make better choices for your clients, but you're also not going to buy into something that can't possibly work. Um, so do your research find out um, what product lines are going to work with not only um, your clients or your demographic of your clients, but are going to give them results that they're expecting. Exactly. Um, you can join us on Aesthetic Advisor as well as Evidence-Based Aesthetician. Aesthetician to get some uh, answers to certain questions. You can email us. Uh, we have podcasts and we definitely have uh, more videos coming uh, into these series. And um, we also love to hear you from you and feedback and questions that you may have on future episodes that you may want to see about. So please feel free to tweet to us, to uh, send us a Facebook message, um, send us an email. What are the questions that you want to know that you have a hard time figuring it out? So this is Chris Group and Dr. Larry Group for Evidence-Based Esthetician, and we'll see you soon. Hi, welcome back to the Evidence-Based Esthetician, and we are joined today with Dr. Larry Group. Howdy. And today we're going to be talking about um, a certain term that is out there um, that's getting a lot of play, and it is the medical esthetician. Um, and I keep seeing people on their Facebook, on business cards, LinkedIn, whatever, um, and they've got their name and they've got medical esthetician after it. And I kept wondering, gee whiz, why does it keep popping up more and more and more frequently? And I went and put medical esthetician into the computer and up pops an ad. And I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Um, there is a, well, first of all, let's talk about what actually is the proper term and the proper licensure. And then we'll get into how medical esthetician is coming about. Um, in the state of Arizona, I am a licensed esthetician. So on my card, it says licensed esthetician. I'm also an educator that is licensed by the Board of Cosmetology, which is a state um, sanctioned board. So the Arizona Board of Cosmetology Cosmetology. and every other state in the union has its own state um, uh, board licensure. of cosmetology where they will license your ability to perform aesthetic service and they'll define those things out of what you can and can't do. In some states you can do more things, in some states you can do less. So in the state of Washington, I am licensed by the Department of Licensure as a master esthetician, um, which is a 1200 hour license. And I also have my educator's license in the state of Washington. So the two types of licensure that I found in the United States, and I haven't found anything else, is either a master aesthetics license, and you've got the state of Washington, the state of Utah, and the state of, I believe, Virginia. Um, and Oregon's going to be offering something sometime soon. And then we have mostly licensed estheticians. And what our practices are, as Dr. Group mentioned, is spelled out in the um, bylaws of the State Board of Cosmetology. Yeah, I think one of the things to, to point out is that there's different levels of hours for certification. Like some states have a 300-hour threshold. Some have a 600. And then to become a master, you either need to be grandfathered in or have taken a 1,200 hours. Could you talk a little bit about the hours component? Let's say for the state of Massachusetts for fun. Um, the state of Massachusetts has a 300-hour um, licensure. But some schools have up to a 1,200-hour program which means they're going to school for 1,200 hours, which would be at a master aesthetics um, license, but the state doesn't recognize it, so you're still a licensed esthetician. Right, and um, regardless of, as long as you meet the minimum hours for that licensure, which is in, this, in the state of Massachusetts, we'll say is licensed esthetician. If you take more, great, you'll probably be better at it, but that doesn't make you have a higher a licensure, whereas, the, as you're saying, in the state of Washington, um, for, for example, they actually have a designation of master esthetician, which has a certain amount of hours 
that are associated with it that not all estheticians are master estheticians unless they take, I believe, is it 1,200 hours? It's 1,200. It's 750 now, so 750 hours um, for an aesthetics license in the state of Washington. And then if you want to be a master esthetician, which is adding in lasers um, and different modalities, um, mid-depth chemical peels, things like that, then that is a 1,200-hour license. Um, so here in the state of Arizona, my license consists of 600 hours. Uh, for a licensed esthetician. And when you start, the lines start getting blurred is more of, we see it all the time in products and services that there's a lot of hype and marketing. And now we're starting to see it that actually concerns our licensure. And so I came across an ad from a um, laser school who has uh, what they consider to be a national brand. Um, and when I read it, I was, not just a little bit dismayed, I was almost a little outraged because it is... We have of, it up here. Yeah, we do have it up here. So it's kind of deceiving in what um, people actually are. It looks like they're talking about that you go to their medical esthetician certification, that you get some sort of certificate that allows you to do uh, more dermal type things as opposed to epidermal, That, in their words. Um, but then if we read um, who qualifies, you'll see though that you, you also need to take a medical aesthetic training course that meets your state standards. So um, again, this state or no other state that I know of has a medical aesthetics training course. They have an esthetician licensing course. So I think what they're uh, we're sort of referring to is basically without spelling it out is you still have to go get your aesthetics license if you want to practice aesthetics. But this course is an extra certification that's not recognized by anyone. Am I catching that right? You absolutely are. And so if you want to practice um, in your state as a licensed esthetician, you need to go to an aesthetic school that is licensed by the state to provide such uh, training. Um, anything that is two weeks, is it, basically this is their laser course that they're rebranding underneath a medical esthetician certificate. But isn't that a problem, Chris? Because doesn't the Arizona uh, Radiation Regulatory Agency, they're the ones that control whether or not a school can offer a certification for lasers, and they don't title it medical esthetician. They, they call it's it a, it's certified. A, it's a, la it's a uh, certified laser technician. Um, yes, okay. and in our state, ARA, the Arizona Radiation Regulatory Agency, regulates our laser programs and then the Arizona BOC which is the Board of Cosmetology regulates the aesthetic programs and those are the only two um, state agencies that can do anything with aesthetics or lasers. Well let me interrupt you on that though. If you were a doctor you could actually have your medical assistant working under your license as a doctor and they could do all kinds of what we could be considered aesthetic procedures or medical aesthetic procedures. But if I, as a doc, allow my medical assistant or just someone here in Arizona to work under my license, that doesn't make them a medical esthetician. They have no standing or no licensure. They're just my assistant doing what doctor groups that tell them to do. So I think it's dangerous um, to talk about and to advertise a medical esthetician certification. And it's because, as we're going to show here in a, in a couple slides, is that the state of Arizona doesn't take kindly to performing aesthetic uh, services. In fact, they're very specific to say that if you use the term esthetician in such a way that it sort of construes that you're licensed, that you're guilty of a misdemeanor. What I don't care for this is it's kind of preying on people's, um, the fact that they don't know what the state laws are. And, and it's giving them a piece of paper that makes them think there's something else. Um, I recently had somebody come to uh, my school to talk about additional training who had been to the school that's in this ad and on her LinkedIn it said nationally certified and I asked her I said well you know that um, there's no such thing as a national certification for lasers every state is different. Well there's no national certification for anything like if I'm a doctor uh, it's my state that allows me to, to to do dentistry or do do medicine. It doesn't, I, I, if I have a, a license in the state of Arizona to be a doctor, I, there's no way to be a national doctor. No, so so you, you can't have that, but when you, when you think that you're getting a piece of paper that says uh, medical esthetician and you paid a lot of money, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for that piece of paper, you believe that that's what you actually are. 
But then when you go to practice, you'll probably find out that gee whiz, you're not, and you're breaking some laws. So it is one of those things that I can have a piece of paper that says I'm the Queen of England, and um, I really doubt anybody's going to think I'm the Queen of England, even if I have a piece of paper from um, the the company next door that says I'm the Queen of England. Well, I think also the unfair part of this thing you bring up a good point is that that's sort of a, a you know a hyperbole. That's kind of an exaggeration. But when people who don't know they go to say they go to one of these enrollment or these uh, you know advising sessions at one of these schools and they they're signed up for a two week course. There's nothing that that's being to told to them that they have to take other licensure. So they go out there and they could theoretically go out and get themselves in a lot of trouble doing a lot of different procedures that they're not licensed and have spent a bunch of money on it with no real recourse. Uh, and if we look at the ad that that's that's uh, we're showing here is this talks. What's the difference between aesthetic school and medical esthetician school? And they're talking about how in, es in esthetician school um, that you learn about the epidermis, but in med medical esthetician school, you learn about the dermis. I think if you went to a es aesthetic school, did you learn anything about the dermis? Absolutely. <laughs> we spent a lot of time learning about the dermis and also the sub -Q and the functions of it. Um, so again, it's one of those things that I keep seeing more and more, but when I put it into the computer and I actually was trying to figure out why it's coming up so much. Um, this popped up and it was a, a pretty, you know, it's an interesting way to market a laser class, but it doesn't do anything other than offer you a laser class. Well, and again, yeah, that, that's the thing. It's, it's really, it's not saying it's a laser class. It's talking about medical aesthetics. But if we look at the subjects that are being, that are being taught are things like laser tattoo removal, laser hair removal, uh, laser acne reduction, um, laser stretch mark reduction. Is that even a something that you can teach in laser school? I don't remember seeing that the Arizona Regula Regulatory Agency has that as a component. Laser stretch marks, stretch no, reduction. that is not on it. Okay. Um, it's not, the other ones are. Okay, so that's what's kind of important. If you're gonna spend money on going to school, make sure A, that the school is an accredited school. When we mean accredited, it means it's licensed by the state. We know of another school that's advertising that you can actually get your aesthetics license here in the state of Arizona, but they're not listed on the Arizona Board of Cosmetology as being an approved school. So I think that'd be important. Well, yeah, if you're looking at getting your licensure and you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time and money, do your due diligence. Go on to the state um, website that is either the Arizona um, uh, BOC or uh, ARA, which is the azrra.gov and look at the schools that are underneath the training and see what they offer. That is the best resource that has nothing to do. I mean, we have a laser school here, but um, I'm not listed on the AZBOC because we're not an aesthetic school at yeah, the we're moment. We're a laser school. So um, as you say, you know, no matter what state you're in, just make sure you're checking out with whatever state body, state governing agency is saying that that school is, is is providing that licensure and then make sure that you're taking at least the minimum level of licensure you need to do the things that you want to do and there are some cases that you there are things that you might want to do that don't fall within any licensure without becoming a doctor or working under a doctor so i guess there's there's some folks here i bring this up for you chris is that there's some folks that want to work for a doctor but don't want to go to become a nurse. Can that happen? Can they work under a doctor's licensure if say they become an esthetician in the laser tech and they want to work and do some more uh, things assisting the doctor in more procedures? Can that happen? If they're working under the doctor's yes. license? Yes. Okay. Um, the doctor can uh, designate them to do additional things, but even in this state, the doctor can't say that you're a laser technician. Right. Um, you, you have to get that certificate from the actual state. So the doctor can't make give you a license, can't say, because you've worked with me, now you're an esthetician, <laughs> no. now you're a, a licensed <laughs> uh, laser technician. No matter, it, it, I could be a dermatologist with 50 years of experience. The only people that can license you are a state agency that handles the licensure. Yeah, just like you can't license me to be a doctor. Right. Um, I can't license you to be an esthetician. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Okay, um, just a quick point on our slides here. Again, um, when we look at the law here from Arizona, we'll see that um, saying that you're an esthetician or using that name on a card or something like that and sort of implying that you're a licensed esthetician, even by using the word esthetician, is actually a crime. And then, of course, doing the services and not being licensed um, is a crime. Now, my understanding, though, there is a few... Uh, recently here in Arizona, since we're in Arizona, we'll talk about that. There's some procedures 
aesthetic procedures you can do that aren't necessarily covered by the order of cosmetology? Is that like eyelash extensions or things like that? Um, eyelash extensions um, aren't covered in like makeup application. And then um, like hair extensions, you don't have to have a cosmetologist license. I remember reading that. That's don't, new. You don't have to if it isn't um, it, like a chemical that's attachment. If it's okay. just using, if there's nothing to attach to the like physical. Little clips, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to be um, uh, licensed. I always recommend that if you are going to somebody that's not licensed, though, um, and it has to state that it is being done by a non licensed professional. And that, so if you're doing. Um, makeup or you're doing eyelash extensions, you have to have a um, poster or something in a public place saying that this service is being performed um, not by a licensed professional. That's true. That's a good um, point. So if that's not there, then they, you should probably shouldn't. And, and also you want to make sure that that person's trained because nobody wants jacked up hair or jacked up eyelashes. <laughs> or, well, at least that's something that grows back out. So <laughs> I think that pretty much ends our hype buster segment. And uh, so if you're uh, basically looking to do some sort of training, our, our number one advice thing is to check with the state agency that's in your state and to see if whether or not that school is approved to give that sort of training and that what you want to do, um, that you're actually getting that degree or getting that certification or getting that licensure. And it usually is going to be something that has some hours to it. We can't think of too many things um, that you can go to school for two weeks um, and become a licensed anything except for... In the state of Arizona, you can become a licensed laser technician or certified laser technician uh, if you give. What are the hours for that? It is 40 hours for theory and another, if you're doing all the modalities, another 48 hours, so 88 hours basically. And then just since I have you on this topic, what do you, in order, when you talk about the modalities, how many treatments do you have to have for each? How does that break down? Because that's something that's very rarely discussed when you go to sit down and you're all excited after your uh, big big uh, big party big party that they throw for you to, to, Woo, to get, to big get flash signed and up lights. we'll give you some alcohol <laughs> yeah, and sign right here get you sign right up <laughs> um it, it's called the 24 10 rule and with 24 10 what that means is 24 hours 10 minimum treatments so for hair reduction uh the state of arizona requires 24 10 24 hours and 10 minimum treatments so 24 and, hours of, of hair reduction of, only of doing the procedure it, it, Okay, here's the gray area. It's 24 hours, um, they say, of observation, 10 minimum treatments. So you have to do 10 treatments, but you can watch most of that time as long as you put your hand on the magical uh, yeah. hand you, As long as you're in the room. Or okay. you can go to a school that specializes in small class sizes, and you could get more hands We on. don't know any of those schools. Not one. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then when we look at other cosmetic lasers, that is um, photofacials, non-ablative non fractional, um, tattoo removal, um, and then some of the other things. And under photofacial, there's a lot of different uh, subsets. And then, um, so you've got like acne scarring, erythema, all that kind of stuff. So you would have to do 24 hours and then 10 minimum treatments. So you would have to have like 10 photofacial treatments and you would also have like 10 um, fractional treatments or 10 tattoo treatments um, to make up the other um, section of it. So it's 48 hours, but they're divided into two sets. This seems complicated to me. It does. Can people have questions? Can they email you or call you Absolutely. and ask the, about this thing? And you'll kind of give them the info without any real guidance on what school to go to, just what, whatever the, the basic requirements are. They can also look this up on uh, the state website. Is that right? Um, yeah. So azrra.gov. And the reason that we're bringing it up on evidence-based esthetician is because everything that we teach here is basically do your research. Yeah. <laughs> Look into it. Even if it's a product, if it's a device, or if it's your training, it is up to you to do your due diligence for yourself. So when you get to the end of it and you've paid thousands of dollars, you get out of it what you were expecting. Um, so it's important to know that when you go in to a situation where it's all fun, flashing lights and alcohol, that, um, what are you talking about when you say that? I've heard that before. Is there other schools that actually have events where they serve alcohol and then ask you to sign up for it? Yes. <laughs> wow. um, and, and that's never a good time to sign a piece of paper. It's like signing up for the army. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> Maybe that's, like what they, to join? that's what they should do. Maybe they'll give them more in the military <laughs> service. Um, yeah, and so, but it's it's all exciting in the moment, and then you sign up for it, and then you go you get done at the end, and you have a piece of paper, and your medical esthetician and it doesn't mean anything nobody is going to accept that it's it's not a real 
thing. So could you get a job with a medical esthetician certification of two no, weeks? No. There, no, there, there is no such thing. It is a made-up term okay. that a company is capitalizing on now because it has got uh, everybody wants to be a medical esthetician. Now, it's not just one company though. We've, we're, yeah, we've now I've seen, seen another there's, one, there's which is very disheartening. Multiple ones out there talking about this idea. So um, our job is to try to give you whatever the facts, objective facts are. We're going to kind of base ourselves on what the state says and what it is that you need to get done by the state in order to become licensed. But that doesn't really help you get a job, does it? Once you have the licensure, then there's all, all kinds of ideas of how much experience do you have, how good are you at it, how busy is that field, and how competitive it is. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that on uh, another um, uh, episode. This was mostly just to to look into it, do your due diligence, don't believe everything that you read. Um, and call and the state. If you have a questions before you sign a contract, call the state up and say, if, if I enroll in this particular program will this allow me to become an esthetician or these things and they'll be pretty straight up with you uh, yeah. yes no maybe or most likely no <laughs> well and, and that's the thing people get so excited and what they need to realize is they think well if i don't sign up today i'm never going to get in there one of my favorites is is from this school somebody sent me a thing it's like i was accepted by them like dude everybody's, everybody's accepted by them accepted, yes okay there isn't one person i've ever not heard accepted and so i want you to feel special but open your eyes yes yeah, so um, not the country club you basically uh everybody who has money gets in exactly so i want them to understand that what and, and know what they're going to get out of it um, again, I have, a, I am a licensed esthetician in the state of Arizona. I am a master esthetician licensed in the state of Washington. Um, that's it. I think if anybody could put medical esthetician, because I, I do basically all lasers and machines, it might be me. And I do not do that because it's no, not be real. me. I could do Okay. That. You could do it. Okay. I'm going to make eyebrows with my yes, I'm 12 going years to, of schooling. Make Dr. Group a medical esthetician. On our next episode, Dr. Group will wax somebody's eyebrows. Wax off? <laughs> wax off. Wax off. And speaking of that, thank you for joining us for our episode of Evidence-Based Esthetician. A myth-busting, hype-busting of what a medical esthetician is or is not. Thank you much.